The following program is sponsored by CBN. Coming up. For all the talk about caravan, could America's next threat come across its northern border? Plus, at home with Fox News host Steve Ducey. When I come home, it just reminds me of a happy time. His family invites us into his kitchen for some of his favorite meals. Everybody, it seems, has a happy food. On today's 700 Club. Welcome, folks, to this edition of the 700 Club. It's like the fires of hell. We can't conceive of anything as awful. The latest outbreak of wildfires in California is now the deadliest in the state's history. At least 44 people are dead as fires consume both ends of the state, and many people are still missing. Most perished in the Northern California fire that devastated the town of Paradise. As Caitlin Burke reports, many of the victims lost their lives trying to flee the coming inferno. The search for bodies in Northern California tells the terrifying story of the victims' attempts to escape. Rescue personnel finding the dead in or next to burned out cars, apparently overcome by smoke and flames before they could get away. I'm surrounded by fire. I'm surrounded by fire right now. I don't know what to do. It was just constant explosions and cars are trying to go around on the side and bursting into flames and people are getting out of their burning cars and running down the middle of the road. Alan Pierce is a nurse. He risked his life evacuating patients from a hospital near Paradise, California, a town that has been completely burned to the ground. Authorities there still searching for more than 200 missing people. Meanwhile, in Southern California, firefighters are gaining ground on the Woolsey fire. But heavy winds are still a major issue, and crews are stretched thin. This hits home on the fact that we are still in significant fire weather, and the existing fire is not our only concern. Celebrities were among the hundreds of thousands forced to evacuate in the Malibu area, and they're also among those who are coming home to nothing. Actor Gerard Butler posted this photo of his burnt out home on Instagram, thanking the Los Angeles Fire Department for their service. It, it's gone. It's everybody I know lost everything. It's real sad. Across California, there are more than 8,000 firefighters battling these wildfires and trying to save as many homes and structures as possible. Caitlin Burke, CBN News. Again, I say pray for those people. It's just, it's just horrible. We can't conceive of it. And the thing that you don't realize is how fast those things can spread. Those flames, those sparks jump across. And there's some people that are saying it may be some uh, explosions off the uh, electric power lines that are causing some of the problems as well. But I don't know the answer to that, but it's been uh, uh, speculated. But it doesn't matter where it came from, whether it was a campfire or whatever. Right now it's, uh, it's spreading so rapidly and the winds don't seem to be abating. They're up to 50, 60 miles an hour. Santa Ana winds blowing across that whole area and dry tender. It's just horrible. And again, I, I would say pray for the people in California and realize what it would be like. You've lost everything. If somebody said, this is my life. It's a couple of uh, bags of stuff in the back of my pickup truck. This is everything. Well, it can't be everything. You know, we've got to have hope in something else besides our possessions. But just put your treasure where moth and rust won't corrode and where thieves don't break in and steal. Well, in other news, one week after votes were cast, the Florida Senate race is still not decided. Ephraim Graham has more of our top stories from the CBN Newsroom. Pat, Republican Rick Scott's lead is just down to 13,000 votes over incumbent Democrat Bill Nelson. 67 counties are recounting more than 8 million ballots. Scott claims Nelson is trying to steal the election through fraud, citing irregularities and failure to comply with the law in Broward County. President Donald Trump even tweeted the election is, quote, infected and called for an end to the recount. A judge ruled there is no evidence of fraud and called on both sides to tone down the rhetoric. On CBN's Faith Nation program, Ken Blackwell of the Family Research Council said there are serious questions about the count in Broward. I think there's enough uh, 
lack of transparency. Uh, there are enough missed deadlines uh, that it really does raise the question as to how they, in fact, found 83,000 votes after the deadline was established for them to at least give a vote count. Former Florida Governor Jeb Bush said Broward election supervisor Brenda Snipe should be fired for incompetence. Another loss for the GOP as Democrat Kristen Sinema wins Arizona's open U.S. Senate seat. She beat Republican Martha McSally. Sinema's win makes her Arizona's first Democratic senator since 1994. She replaces Republican Senator Jeff Flake, who opted not to run. McSally might still make it to the Senate, however. John Kyle, who is filling John McCain's Senate seat, is expected to step down in January. And there is speculation Arizona's Governor Doug Ducey could appoint McSally. Pat? Well, we want to take a look at that election because I think it's important. When we look at the ultimate result, it looks as if the Republicans are going to lose 40 seats in the House of Representatives. Uh, it looks like they may win one extra seat uh, in the Senate, possibly two, if that Florida race comes through and, and Bill Nelson goes down. But that will be it. Now, they're talking about 32 right now, but I think it'll go to 40. Now, ladies and gentlemen, I want you to think a little bit with me as to what's going on in the world. What was the major issue in this election? Was it the caravan? Was it immigration? Was it the wall? None of those things. And despite the fact that we have had tremendous tax cuts to the average citizen, what really counts is health care. Now, here's the deal. There was something called the Affordable Care Act. There was a man named Jonathan Gruber who said basically it was set up to fail. We, we set it to fail. We knew those exchanges wouldn't work, and we knew they would ultimately collapse. And when they did, we would then go to a single-payer health uh, system with the government running it. The Speaker of the House, Nancy Pelosi, said it's 2,300 pages. And he said, we'll have to pass it so we can understand what's in it. There wasn't one single, you talk about this, all this talk about bipartisanship, there wasn't one single Republican vote in favor of that health care. It was an abomination, and the Republicans, as a man, ran against it, and they said, we're going to replace Obamacare, and we're going to, excuse me, re 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 revoke it, and then we will replace it with something better. The House of Representatives had a tremendous bill all passed. In, and certainly, they had provision for pre-existing illness. They had something that would not in any way count the pregnancy as some kind of a uh, disqualifying factor. And it, they had everything ready. Well, it came before the Senate, came before the Senate, and there was one vote. And maybe we've got a picture of that one vote. And here he is right now. Senator John McCain of Arizona stood before the Senate, and he was a deciding vote. And he turned his hand down, and he killed that. You see that? He killed that measure. That one vote took it out of the Senate. And they dropped it because then they had to uh, get Judge Kavanaugh confirmed. They wanted to pass tax cuts and so forth. But they didn't return to it. And what did the Democrats use as an issue? They used health care, health care, health care, health care. And in the process, they took down 40. That's the total when it's finally all the counts over very distinguished uh, congressman who'd been serving uh, dis with distinction for a number of years. They took them all out, uh, and they only won one extra seat in the, high, in the Senate, unless maybe the, the, the Rick Scott thing turns out and Bill Nelson goes down. That would only be two. Other than that, it was a disaster. I'm not sure how many governors, but what happened was they were not able to turn the major states in the Midwest uh, you know, for example, uh, the, the uh, governor of Wisconsin was defeated by the, the labor unions, one after him. They, they did not succeed in Michigan. They, they, they did not succeed in the Midwest. And a lot of uh, congressmen were defeated. So what happened? 
Well, that's the result of that particular election. But would they ever have a chance to do something else? We don't know. But what I do know is that the Democrats have socialists running a major part of their party. Bernie Sanders is a socialist. And there are others who are turning to socialists. And the young people in our society don't understand the difference. And I think back to England after World War II. Churchill led a coalition that beat the Nazis and brought forth a great victory. He comes home and the people said, well, we don't think that you're exactly running the way we'd like you to. They turned him out of his seat and they took over. The Labor Party took over. They socialized the railroads and they socialized the steel and they socialized the, car, the coal and they ruined the economy. That's what's happening here in America, ladies and gentlemen. But remember, one person who was on a vendetta against Donald Trump. Now, the thing that's coming up, uh, he's got a couple of years left to go until the general election. And unless something is done to change it, he is not going to be reelected unless he can win suburban women and, you know, get back. And those Hispanics are on... Nevada, they lost a Senate seat. Arizona, they lose a Senate seat. Texas, they almost lost the Senate seat. These are heavily Hispanic neighborhoods, and he's got to do something to reach out to those people, and he sure has got to do something to reach out to suburban women. Well, it certainly shows us the significance of midterm elections and the ongoingness of what we choose there, but also the impact that's coming. Two years flies by. But <laughs> you, you, you can't miss the mood of the election. They missed it on health care, and the Democrats demagogued the whole thing over and over and over again. But one man, and I'm not supposed to speak ill of the dead because he's passed on, but one vote by one man killed the repeal of Obamacare, which he had run on and which all of the Republicans had run on, and by failing to take care of that, you leave a vacancy, you leave a vacuum, and you don't deal with it, and it comes back to haunt you. So just I hope as a nation we'll, uh, we'll take a lesson from, from this before it's too late. But it seems like the young people in America don't have a clue about how bad socialism. They don't have a clue about what it is, and they think that, oh, isn't this wonderful, all this rhetoric and all this hoopla? Well, there's been a lot done in the education area that has emptied out the truth of the past and Absolutely. even the merit of our country's moorings, well, you know. Well, exactly. Well, the, the, the educators have dumped on the, the uh, older generation. You know, they were racist. They were uh, fascist. They were this, that, and the other. Okay. Well, I just pointed that out. One man, one vote cost the Republicans 40 seats and, uh, uh, well... It's going to take a heroic effort to turn that around at this point. Ephraim? Pat, I want to turn now to the Middle East, where Israelis' armed forces are responding to more than 400 rocket attacks from Gaza over the last day. As Chris Mitchell reports from southern Israel, the Jewish state sits on a knife's edge between a ceasefire and a war. This is the sound of war in southern Israel. Gaza terrorists launched some 400 rockets at Israel. The Iron Dome anti-rocket system struck down about 100. Some fell inside populated areas. This is a building in Ashkelon that took a direct hit from one of the rockets fired out of Gaza about 12 miles to the south. You can see the walls that have been blown out. You can see this is the kitchen. You can see cookies in the cupboards. You can see the damage that had because of the, uh, because of the rocket. A man in his 40s died because of this. Two women were seriously injured. And this is just one of the hundreds of rockets that have been fired out of Gaza into Israel in the past 24 hours. First responders removed the man's body from the rubble. The barrage puts Israelis on edge. Beton Mamon lives next door. The feeling is very bad. I have a father who is old, he's uh, 19 years old, and he was uh, terrible. Last, last night he was panic. Israel police spokesman Mickey Rosenfeld said there are about one million Israelis affected by this current round of violence. 
Well, the message to the public is to stay safe. When the sirens go off, there are 15 seconds or 30 seconds or 45 seconds to take cover. The IDF responded by attacking some 150 Hamas and Palestinian Islamic Jihad military targets in Gaza, including a Hamas television station and governmental structures. I think we're in a difficult period at the moment. It could be 24 hours, 48 hours. Uh, it will pass. The IDF is doing everything they can. The Israeli National Police are protecting the civilians within inside the populated areas, within inside all the cities in the south. The U.S. led the condemnation of the rocket barrages against Israel. Jason Greenblatt tweeted, Israel is forced once again into military action to defend its citizens. We stand with Israel as it defends itself against these attacks. As Israel teeters on the brink of war, Mamon said if it was up to him, he'd know what to do. Tell Trump to tell Bibi and Lieberman to walk to finish this area Gaza. That's it. They don't want to live in peace. They choose blood. Chris Mitchell, CBN News, Ashkelon, Israel. Hi, opening words, Pat. You know, uh, what does it say in the Bible? Wisdom is justified by its children. And leaders make dumb mistakes, and then their citizens ultimately have to pay for it. Ariel Sharon, uh, he's a was a friend of mine, or he's, he's a, still alive, but uh, he was very gracious. We, we got to know him. But uh, he decided that he was going to make a gesture toward the Palestinians, and he was going to pull out of Gaza. They had a number of Israeli settlers in there, a population that was, the, the theory was to populate the West Bank with Jews and Israelis, and therefore, you know, keep the population uh, from warfare. So, but he pulled them out, and they were forcibly, they were literally forced at gunpoint away from their homes. They were driven out, the Israeli, to their own citizens. And they left Gaza to the Palestinians. What happened to the Palestinians? Hamas took over, a radical group. And now they're in Gaza, and why would they want to do what they're doing? Well, they're radicals. They, they want to fight. That's, that's their M.O. And so, uh, DNA, I should say, and so they want to have fights, so they launch all these rockets against Israel. Well, Israel can't stand that, so what are they going to have to do? They're going to have to send their troops in and literally take back Gaza. If they don't do it, they're going to have a sore spot over and over and over again. So, uh, all I can say is they'd better get ready for war, because that's what's going to happen. They can roll over Gaza without a whole lot of uh, problem. I don't think it's going to be any problem. Uh, and they need to secure it again. But, but the, the fact that they had all those settlements, all those people had businesses and farms and everything taken out of all of them. And it was a tragic, tragic mistake of leadership. I just mentioned about what happened to, to the Republican Party and how they lost out on this last election. This is how the Israelis have lost out in Gaza. Now, there's something else, by the way. It has nothing to do with global warming. It has nothing to do with automobile emissions. It has nothing to do with natural gas. It has nothing to do with coal-fired furnaces. <laughs> but according to the scientists, we're in for a record cold. Ephraim, tell us about it. But as you said, scientists say this winter could bring record cold, and it's all because of a lack of sunspots. Dr. Tony Phillips of SpaceWeather.com says there's been practically no sunspots in 2018, and that's causing Earth's upper atmosphere to cool and even shrink. If the trend continues, one NASA scientist says we could be seeing record cold temperatures in just a matter of months. Pat, for many of us, it's already too cold. <laughs> well, I'm looking forward to I've got a few wool garments. I just soon have a little cold, but it, it can be really rough. And, you know, Joe Bastardi warned about this, that they're forecasting this winter is going to be something. I don't know if we're starting a little ice age or anything, but uh, it, all this business about global warming now is climate change. And, you know, mm -hmm. uh -huh. <laughs> get your turtlenecks out. All right. <laughs> well, up next, a rising threat on our northern border, thanks to the policies of Canada's prime minister. He's actually said that if you are opposed to ISIS fighters returning to Canada, it is because you're Islamophobic. In other words, it's not them that's the issue. It's your opposing their return makes you Islamophobic. It makes you racist.
How Canada now presents a danger to the United States after this. Well, despite some recent disagreements over trade, the U.S. and Canada have a great relationship. And that could change if our northern neighbor doesn't stop its policy of a welcoming, welcoming Islamic extremists like ISIS. In Canada, they'll heard reports. The U.S. and Canada share the longest undefended border in the world. There hasn't been a reason to defend it because there hasn't been a serious threat from either country in a couple hundred years. There is now. Canada is today the happy home of thousands of radical Islamists, ex-ISIS fighters and the Muslim Brotherhood. Their numbers continue to grow and they've infiltrated the Canadian government on several levels. Many Americans assume that all is peaceful and well with their northern neighbor. But security experts here warn that by welcoming radical Islamists, Canada now presents a danger to the United States. Terrorism expert David Harris, who worked for CSIS, Canada's spy agency, told us a major attack on the United States by Muslim extremists based in Canada is only a matter of time. Many years ago, I suggested that many of the Islamist extremists might regard Canada as uh, an aircraft carrier from which to maintain operations against the United States. Canada is becoming a foundational sort of place for Islamists of all stripes, including the Iranians, by the way. Thomas Quiggin is one of the authors of Submission, the danger of political Islam to Canada with a warning to America. He says Canada is in denial over the terror threat it's created for itself and the United States. And the denier-in-chief is Prime Minister Justin Trudeau, who welcomed returning ISIS fighters back to Canada, saying they would be a powerful voice. He's actually said in our parliament, sort of like out loud on the public record, that if you were opposed to ISIS fighters returning to Canada, it is because you're Islamophobic. In other words, it's not them that's the issue. It's your opposing their return makes you Islamophobic, it makes you racist. I think there's the idea that, well, we need to welcome everyone because everyone's wonderful, so kumbaya. Toronto Sun columnist and XM Sirius Canada host Anthony Fury. Heavens, this notion that ISIS fighters are somehow uh, deserving of kind of a, a respect and a cultural accommodation just as much as anyone else is nonsense. Assalamu alaikum. Hello, my friends. This is Prime Minister Trudeau sending an official greeting to Canada's annual Reviving the Islamic Spirit Convention, which he attended as a member of Parliament even after news reports the event was linked to a group that has funded Hamas. This is also about celebrating our shared beliefs in justice, fairness, equality of opportunity and acceptance. And it was quite startling for people to say, do you know who you're talking to? And why would you say you're, that you share their values when their values are anti-democratic, anti-women's rights, pro-slavery, uh, pro-stoning of women? I mean, the stuff that's on some of their websites here in Canada is startling. There have been lone wolf attacks on the U.S. from Canadian Muslim terrorists ever since the Quebec-based Millennial Bomber tried to cross the border to blow up LAX in 1999. But the Islamist threat to Canada has been played down. July's attack on the Danforth in Toronto, where two women were gunned down and 13 injured, has been spun by the government and media as a mental health issue on the part of the gunman, even though friends of the killer said he never exhibited poor mental health. Fury accuses police of a cover-up. There's been a total cone of silence around the Danforth shooting story. I wrote a feature where I found out that the family statement, which said mental illness, nothing to see here, that had actually been sort of co-authored and put together by a, a spin doctor and also a Muslim community activist. Much of Canada's mainstream media seems to stand with the Islamist. The Toronto Star announced it was no longer using the name the Islamic State because something so barbaric could not be Islamic. Parliament passed the notorious M103 anti-Islamophobia motion last year. Critics call it a government attempt to silence any criticism of Islamists in Canada.
The government's welcome mat is not lost on the host of this Canadian Muslim program on the internet. But we, well, of course, all of us take it for granted in, uh, in, see, in Canada. You see, so. Akhi, Alhamdulillah, Canada has given us his blessings. Alhamdulillah. Alhamdulillah, Alhamdulillah. Canada is your country. Islam is today the fastest growing religion in Canada. And Montreal based terrorism expert Mark Labouy says the demographic change because of immigration from the Islamic world is not only profound, but dangerous. I claim that the vast majority of Sunni-based Islamic institutions in the province of Quebec and also in Canada are Islamist. Labouy says Islamists have infiltrated Canada's government and its security services, in some cases at the invitation of the government. Police forces such as Ottawa, where they have visited radical preachers in order to recruit them to join the police force at some point or another. But the Canadian government has done more than welcome dangerous Islamists. Quiggin accuses it of funding terrorism through its financial support of some Muslim groups. And if terrorists based here attack the U.S., he won't be surprised. In the past, I think Canada would have had a defense. We could say, look, we tried to get this stuff stopped but we failed. But if it happens this time, we won't have that defense. The problem is so advanced, the government agencies in charge of our national security are so compromised that it will be very, very difficult to be able to turn things around. Dale Hurd, CBN News, reporting from Ottawa and Toronto. You know, the Bible says the government will be upon his shoulders, and I thank God it's on him and not on me because wouldn't you hate to be in the shoes of President Trump, having to deal with Korea, having to deal with nuclear threats, having to deal with the restive population at home, having to deal with a media that hates you, having to deal with a next door neighbor that is turning Islamic, having to deal with uh, what's happened in Saudi Arabia, all of these things. You better pray for our president because you know, the truth is the government is on the shoulders of Jesus, and he's the only one that's smart enough to figure it out. Terry? Well, coming up, her innocence was stolen as a child. So as an adult, she turned to stripping. I felt like I had this power over men. It was, look at me, I'm somebody. When you have that power, you feel like you're somebody. See how this stripper breaks free from a prostitution ring when we come back. You're watching the 700 Club, and boy, it's a jam-packed show today. I'm so glad you're with us, and I hope you enjoy what's coming. This is a terrific story about a woman named Sally Bray. Sally never dreamed she'd grow up to become a stripper, and eventually run her own escort service. But the die was cast early on when Sally suffered sexual abuse at the hands of a family member. From that point on, man after man abused her until Sally just said, I want to die. I believed that I was worthless, that I was never going to amount to anything, that um, I couldn't survive on my own, that um, I was a loser. Because of her verbally abusive father, Sally Bray spent most of her childhood feeling unworthy of affection. One of the only times she felt loved was when a different family member was sexually abusing her. I had this sick thing in my mind that what I was doing was love. I associated it with love, that this family member loved me, though I knew it was wrong. I, kn I knew it was wrong, and, and I carried that with me all my life. In her teens, she used sex as a way to find love, and by 17, had married an older man. But the abuse continued, now physical, at the hand of her husband. Sometimes the beatings were pretty severe, and um, I was one of those women that kept going back and kept going back. And then when my son was 
I think four years old. My husband had me and was dragging me around the house by my hair and was slamming me into kitchen cabinets. And my little boy was standing there screaming, Daddy, stop. And I told myself, I can't do this anymore. This is never going to stop. Either I'm going to wind up killing him or he's going to wind up killing me. She eventually divorced her husband and turned to stripping for a sense of power and a way to make fast money. I felt like I had this power over men. It was, look at me, I'm somebody. I felt like somebody. You know, when you have that power, um, you feel like you're somebody. Sally ran an escort service with girls at the club that became a prostitution ring with adoring clients. They would provide just about anything you wanted or needed for that comfort in bed, for the sex. Cocaine fueled her sexual lifestyle until one day she had a brief moment of clarity. I found myself locked in a bathroom and um, was shooting myself up and I blacked out. And when I woke up, that needle was hanging out of my arm and blood was dripping down my arm. And I looked at myself in the mirror and I said, there's gotta be something other than this. In her 30s, she was able to get off drugs and left the sex industry. Sally married several more times with each marriage ending in disappointment. In 2011, her husband took his own life while on the phone with Sally sending her further into a spiral of pain and emptiness. I knew I was one drink away from going back to the hood to find crack. I knew I was, I was a drink away from putting a crack pipe in my mouth or, or a needle in my arm. I just, I felt defeated, defeated, deflated. I was, I was done. I just wanted to die that life just wasn't worth living because if life was nothing but pain, why do I want to go through more pain? You know, constant pain. Alcohol masked her pain until she met Roland, who was a Christian, and saw Sally's wounded heart. Roland told me once, he said, you know, underneath this tough exterior that you want people to see, this tough woman is really a broken person. And excuse me, I just looked at him and I said, don't tell anybody. Because I didn't want, I didn't want people to know how vulnerable I really was. Sally agreed to go to church with Roland, though she was afraid she would be judged and rejected. But what happened next took her by surprise. The minute I walked in that door, I felt God. I felt him. I felt it in those handshakes that the women would give you when you when you were met. And that's when God spoke. Excuse me. He said, Sally, I know you hurt. People will fail you, but I never will. I have watched you all your life. I love you. He, God, spoke those words to me. And that was that defining moment or that aha moment that I knew everything was going to be okay. And I was all in. When he spoke to me, it was like, he's real. God's real. He loves me. After decades of heartbreak and despair, Sally found the love she had always longed for when she gave her life to Jesus that day. It was better than any drug I could have ever taken in in all my life of drug addiction and alcoholism. And I I didn't crave any of it. I didn't want any of it. It was just overnight. It was gone. You know, and I was just so full and, and peaceful. I was at, I was at peace. And I no longer felt worthless. I felt love. I felt love. Sally and Roland soon married. They now minister together with their band, Bearing Armor, pointing others to the love of God as the only way to freedom and wholeness. 
that emptiness that I felt inside, those names that I called myself, um, were gone. Because now I'm, I'm, I'm the daughter of Christ. I'm a, I'm a daughter of the King. I have, a, I have a heavenly Father who loves me. And that's better than, than anything here on this earth. We don't have any conception of how much God loves us. If you were the only person in the world, if you were the only one out of all of creation, Jesus Christ, God's Son, would still have died for you. That's how precious you are. And your life is valuable. You are special. You are the daughter of a king. You are the son of a king. You're a royal person. But you have to accept that sonship. You have to acknowledge your father. And you have to come home. Oh, Sally suffered. How many women have been put down, told they were worthless, told they weren't beautiful, told they were trash, they were garbage, been insulted? How many of you watching me have said that, have been said to you? Sally had it said to her over and over again. And then the physical abuse and the beatings and the horrible things. Oh, I, I just can't conceive of what people have suffered. But the Lord felt your pain. He knows how you hurt. And what he says is, daughter, son, come home. I'm going to throw my arms around you. I want to ring, put a ring on your finger. I want to put shoes on your feet. I want to prepare a banquet for you. I want to make you part of my family. I want to adopt you into the family of God. Would you like that? Why do you want to feel worthless? The devil will tell you you're not any good. But God says, you are special to me. And if you want that right now, I want you to do something. I want you to pray with me and let the anointing and the love of God come into your life. Just bow your head and pray these words. Lord, you know what I have been through. You know what people have said to me. You know what they've said about me. You know the feeling I've had that I'm not worthy. And I come before you and I acknowledge that I'm a sinner. And I'm not worthy of your love. But Lord, I know you died for me. And so right now, I give you my heart. And I ask you to come take over my life and live in me from this moment on. I am yours. And I thank you that you are mine. Now, if you prayed with me, I want to pray for you very quickly. Just bow your head wherever you are. Father, for everyone who prayed that prayer, may the anointing of the Holy Spirit rest upon them in the name of Jesus. Fill them with your spirit. Amen. Wherever you are, please give us a call. Tell us what you've just done. You know, the Bible says if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God raised you from the dead, you'll be saved. You need to somehow make a confession of what you've just done. Don't be afraid of the Lord. He's not ashamed of you. Don't be ashamed of him. Call right now. It's a toll-free number. It won't cost you a thing. 1-800-700-7000. Just call and say, I prayed with Pat. I gave my heart to the Lord. And I am part of the family of God. I am redeemed. And I am thankful that I have a loving Heavenly Father. Terry, what's next? Well, still ahead, Fox & Friends host Steve Ducey talks about food and happiness. When I come home for my, for my uh, birthday meal, you know, I'm eight years old again. It just reminds me of a happy time. Everybody, it seems, has a happy food. We're going to join Steve and Kathy Ducey in their family kitchen with the Happy Cookbook.
And welcome back to the 700 Club. Amazon has chosen to split its new headquarters between two locations, New York City and Northern Virginia. The online retailer is expected to make an official announcement today. The decision will end an intense competition between cities. Amazon says it will split the 50,000 new jobs promised between the two cities. New York Mets minor leaguer and former NFL quarterback Tim Tebow is adding television show hosts to his, to his list of off-season jobs. Tebow will be hosting a 10-episode high-stakes physical competition show on CBS called The Million Dollar Mile. During the show, contestants will have a chance to win $1 million every time they run the designated course. Standing in their way is the most challenging course ever designed and a group of elite athletes on a mission to stop the contestants from winning that money. Tebow says watching people compete at their highest ability is inspirational to him. Remember, you can always get the latest from CBN News by going to our website. It's CBNNews.com. Pat and Terry are back with more of today's 700 Club. It's coming up right after this. Oh, you look forward to it. I tell you, that copy is so good. And I read that stuff. And I, I, when something's well written like that, oh, it's, it's just beautiful. flows, doesn't it? I, I'm great. a great Scrooge, too. <laughs> Bob Cratchit and all those people. I mean, and, and, and the ghost of Christmas present and past. Yes, it was fun, I'll bet. A lot of fun. That's and great. Well, anyhow, that's going to be available. Plus, we had a team go out to all the places where there's, you know, to learn how come there's Christmas stockings. How come Santa's got reindeer and all that? I mean, it's going to be fun. Yeah, for a gift of $25 or it's more, we're going to send bargain. both. Let me tell you, it is a <laughs> flat-out bargain. Okay. Okay. Well, good times and good food. Those are the main ingredients inside this new cookbook from Steve Ducey and his wife, Kathy. It's beautiful. But it was a serious health threat that first motivated Kathy to gather her family's favorite recipes all together. Recently, the Ducey's invited us into their home to talk about the food and fond memories that make up the Happy Cookbook. Take a look. Fox and Friends host author Steve Ducey and his wife, Kathy, are known for their lighthearted take on family life. They reminisce about some of their favorite memories and recipes in their new book, The Happy Cookbook. So many of our events in life are around meals, whether it's an anniversary or a wedding or a birthday. And when you think back in time, there's a food associated with it. For instance, we were in Rome, I guess it was downtown, uh, next to the, I want to say the Pantheon. We had the best pizza we'd ever had. And it was just, it was a flatbread. It just had tomatoes, a little, didn't have a lot of tomato sauce on it. And in fact, it didn't have any. And it was like, that's the best pizza we've ever had. And then we started making it for the kids. You made it from memory. That was before people took pictures of food. That's right. <laughs> My kids would rather have home cooking than eat anywhere. And I think a lot of people are like that because on Steve's birthday, we could go to any fancy restaurant in New York, but he wants his mom's pot roast, and German chocolate cake. And then he'll have the cake for breakfast the next day. <laughs> And that just makes me happy. And, you know, regardless of what went on in my day, that day, when I come home for my uh, birthday meal, I'm eight years old again. It just reminds me of a happy time. And we got to talking about everybody, it seems, has a happy food. You know, something that might remind you of your wedding or your anniversary or that place you went when your kids were little. Fond memories and good times are the main ingredients for these recipes. But the inspiration for the book came from something far more serious. In late 2015, at a routine eye exam, Kathy was diagnosed with ocular melanoma, a rare form of eye cancer. It's a very aggressive form of cancer that spreads very quickly. And at that point, they didn't know if mine had spread or not. It did not. I'm OK. But all I could think of was, I've got to get my recipes together for the kids, because if I'm not here anymore, they need to know how to make the dressing and the cookies. I wanted my girls to have the recipes that they grew up with. That was really the germ of the idea. And we decided we would put together our family recipe favorites and those of some of our friends and neighbors and some famous people we know. And that's where the Happy Cookbook came from. It's just a, it's a celebration of the recipes that make America smile. The Ducey's say that when it comes down to it, it's about more than just the food. It's about the stories that go with it. For instance, 
whenever I think about our wedding reception, I think about a cake. But what happened to the cake? Well, my mom said, I'm gonna bring you the cake from Abilene, Kansas. And we were getting married in Kansas City. And so it never dawned on my parents, you know, a beautiful three layer cake in the trunk of a car driving across Kansas when it's over hundred degrees. So they pull up where we're getting married and we have the ceremony. And as we're walking toward the car, I knew something was up because right under the tailpipe, there was like dribbling frosting. It was a pink and white frosting, just like that. And I said, yeah, that's not good. And we opened it up and it, it had just smushed. It had, it had fallen. And we went to the reception uh, restaurant and my dad who felt terrible because, you know, they had brought a, a slurry cake said to the waiter, could, can you do anything with this? And he goes, we could give everybody a straw. <laughs> yeah, thanks. My dad convinced him, take it in the back room, come back with something. Half an hour later, he comes back. Instead of three layers, it was one. And it, it looked fine. It did have kind of a steel belted radial aftertaste. But other than that, it was a happy memory. Stephen Cathy's new cookbook celebrates those memories and also gives others the chance to make new ones. Well, there is a certain kind of communion at dinner time around the table. And whether, wherever you're breaking bread, it, it's a special moment. That's why you start the meal with prayer oftentimes, because it is a special event in your, in your day. And so we hope that when people sit down and have a meal, they realize, you know, we don't know how this is gonna go, but this meal could have a happy significance that we'll never forget about. You know, it could be the meal uh, before you're married or an anniversary, but you just never know when, when something is gonna happen where years later, you'll see that food again and it will trigger something in the nostalgia department of your brain and you'll remember, oh, remember? Every time I see a car trunk, I think, <laughs> wedding cake. Well, if you enjoyed listening to Steve and Kathy reminisce, you are going to love the Happy Cookbook. I collect cookbooks. This has to be added to the collection. Beautiful pictures, amazing, wonderful recipes inside of here, but lots of fun stories also about how the recipes came to be and why they're special. Oh, so fun. it's available wherever cookbooks yeah, are sold okay. or wherever cookbooks are sold. Yeah, there you period. go. Yep. All right. Okay, time for some email. Let's you ready? Take it first. Okay, this is Gary who says, How do you get someone to forgive you for a sin you committed against them if they won't accept a sincere apology? Uh, you can't. Uh, if you remember you've got somebody got all against you, go to them and ask for their forgiveness. If they won't accept it, that's their business. Uh, if you hold something against them, you forgive in your heart and get on with your life. I mean, if, if they won't receive it, it's not your fault. You, you can't control what somebody else will do. What you can control is what's in your heart. You take care of what's in you and you reach out. Remember, if you're offering your gift and you remember somebody's got all against you, he wants to go kill you, go to try to reconcile with him. If you remember that you've got something against them, then you forgive them in your heart. But it's your deal, not theirs, okay? Okay, this is Diana who says, Dear Pat, I work in health care, and one day I personally witnessed someone lay hands on a patient and pray for them, and they were healed. I would love to be able to do this. How do I go about developing this gift? Do I just pray and ask God for this gift? I think so. If, look, if you're filled with the Spirit, and you have to be, there has to be the baptism of the Holy Spirit, He indwells us. You know, if you're in Christ, the Holy Spirit is within you, and, you know, you shall eat good by the fruit of your lips. So what do you do? Speak it. Speak it. Speak it. In the name of Jesus, speak it. And that's what God did at creation, and that's what you do if the Holy Spirit is within you. But you need to ask Him to fill you with His Spirit, that you, when you are filled with the Spirit, then good things happen. All right? 
This is Jessica who says, Dear Pat, recently I've been getting in debates with a coworker about baptism and the meaning of John 3, 5, where Jesus says in order to get into heaven, one must be, quote, born of water and the spirit. My coworker says that means you need to be baptized in order to be truly saved. I always understood it, that born of water was the physical birth. Spirit is when you accept Christ as your savior and being baptized is a symbol of the death and resurrection. Two times he brought this up since our first talk a few days ago. What should I do to stop this from escalating? Uh, I used to have an associate who was in the Church of Christ, and he banged on me about, you must be baptized, you must be baptized. And I said, look, I've been baptized in water. I've been baptized in water the second time, and I've been baptized in the Holy Spirit. Now, that's enough, you know? <laughs> And I'm done. I'm done. <laughs> I've got it done. You know, so I think, you know, you just make sure that you've done all the stuff. And then don't worry about what this co-worker says. And don't argue about stuff like that. I mean, just walk away. All right. This is Linda who says, how do you know as a Christian when to leave a church? How can you tell when the Holy Spirit has withdrawn his power from a local assembly? Well, I, I can't tell you how. You, you know, you can buy your fruit. You shall know them. What is the fruit? That's what you've got to, is there love? Is there joy? Is there power? Uh, are they demonstrating the fruit of the Spirit? Are they demonstrating the gifts of the Holy Spirit? Are they moving in love with each other? And if there's dissension and discord and that kind of thing, walk away. Don't be part of it, you know? And good word. Good word, all right. Well, we leave with today's Power Minute from the Psalms. Happy are the people whose God is the Lord. Thank you for being with us, for Terry and me and all of us at CBN. This is Pat Robertson. Thank you so much for being with us. And Lord willing, I believe you I will. And Wendy will be here tomorrow. I will be here with Wendy tomorrow, and we will oh, we'll have all kinds of wonderful things, including John Carter Cash, who is Johnny Cash's son. Mm -hmm. okay. Make some iron pot chili. I can hardly wait. <laughs> <All right. laughs> see you tomorrow. Bye-bye. <laughs>